AI will not replace doctors and nurses, but nurses and doctors who use AI will replace doctors and nurses who don't. So if we look at this post-COVID new normal we're living in, we have a huge staffing problem. And that is we're not getting enough graduates to, from medical school. We're not getting enough specialists to the right areas to see the patients and match supply and demand. So truly the only way we can do that is to make sure the right patient sees the right doctor in the right setting at the right time for the right quality for the right cure. At Mayo Clinic, there are three people, three experts, who can listen to your voice and make a diagnosis of Parkinsonism or Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, just from your voice. Well, what's the likelihood that a person in a rural area of the United States can fly to Rochester, Minnesota and get an appointment with one of three people? It's hard. So what did we do? We did supervised learning of a model based on 10,000 voice samples with the three experts curating the AI results. We now have an AI model that can be deployed anywhere. So you could be in a rural place, pick up your phone and say, la, 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 and in five seconds, you have a likelihood of a neuromuscular problem. We're gonna get you an appointment. And so that's the example of democratization of specialty knowledge by placing it in algorithms that then scale globally and aren't limited by just the few human experts that can do the task. A number of my colleagues had an observation. If you could record cough on a cell phone, just a simple sound recording, <coughs> you could run an AI model and diagnose tuberculosis, COVID, or something simple like a flu or an RSV virus. And they, with 85% accuracy, can take a cough on a phone and tell you what you've got. And do you know they've deployed this app throughout the developing world, have now over 600,000 patients using it? And it was a simple idea with simple technology that used AI to great effect. So I remember reading a particular article, and doctors and nurses will be demeaned and replaced. The technology described was the telephone. <laughs> I think we've probably seen that that hasn't come to pass. It just means that doctors and nurses work differently. And of course, as technologies evolve, jobs are displaced, that's true. But very often those displaced then take on more cognitive work. So if we can take administrative burden, rote tasks, and those can be automated, well, that frees up the individual to learn, to grow, to take on a, a new challenge. And AI models that take that ambient listening and turn it into data, in effect, we're really close to the notion of AI filling out the chart so the clinician simply has to edit as opposed to type in 140 different things. And what does that mean? It means you get back to your patients. <laughs> you focus on why you went to into medicine to begin with, the science, the empathy, and the direct patient contact. So I think AI is probably our greatest opportunity to restore the joy in practice by returning clinicians to what they do best, touching and caring for every patient who wants their care. What is the role of private industry? What is the role of government? So we brought in FDA, Health and Human Services, the White House, and their observers in this collaborative process we call the Coalition for Health AI. We don't attempt to influence policy or make regulation, but we hope to set up the set of processes, some of which will ultimately be incorporated into regulation. I've served multiple presidents, and my experience is you have to be very careful with legislation and regulation having unintended consequences. Government is actually pretty good at setting standards. Government isn't so good at innovation or creating software. So it's this combination of 
government setting the standards, but private industry doing the innovation. When you go to the grocery store and you pick up a can of soup, it says, oh, so many grams of fat, so much sodium, so many calories, and you can say, hmm, I don't really think that's for me. When you pick up an AI algorithm, today you have no idea. Yeah, I mean, it could be 5,000 calories and 200% fat. Who knows, right? And so you need a soup label for every algorithm telling you what data went into it, how does it perform, is it likely to be fit for purpose. Technology, policy, and culture must move together simultaneously. And that is just because there's a new tech doesn't mean you can deploy it without guidance and guardrails. You need the appropriate safeguards, the monitoring and the measures, but you also need to meet culture. So let's be a little careful as we innovate to put those guidance and guardrails and risk assessments and then work with the patients and the doctors and nurses to ensure it's not technology for technology's sake, but something that's actually going to help them in their day-to-day -day practice. And that combination, technology, policy, and culture moving together will ensure we do this right.